Hello, I'm Ken Walsh. This is one in my series of videos on Old Testament leaders. Today, I'll be discussing Abraham, the patriarch of the Israelites' monotheism. Abraham, along with Moses and David, shaped the development of Judaism, out of which grew Christianity. Both religions have had a huge influence on Western culture. After a short introduction, I'll summarize the Abraham Bible story and provide some commentary for your consideration. This format is a lecture with slides. By way of background, I taught the Old Testament and ancient history for 14 years at a tuition-free Jesuit inner city middle school for boys from low-income families of various religious and non-religious backgrounds. My personal challenge was how to make everyone comfortable in my religion class, how to teach without preaching a particular religious point of view to children who range from evangelicals to non-church Christians, atheists, Buddhists, and Muslims, a real mix reflecting life today. Today's presentation grew out of my teaching and my recently published book, Bible Stories for All Without the Dogma, a part of cultural literacy. As we become an increasingly secular society, many do not understand the biblical influences that have crept into our lives. I wrote my book for the non-Christians and non-practicing Christians who would like to better understand Bible stories and their influence on Western culture. And also for Christians and Jews who would like to know more about the history, geography, and cultural practices of the time. After all, Bible stories do not happen in a vacuum. My book was written for everyone and without the sectarian doctrine of religious denominations. Bible Stories for All Without the Dogma in this series of videos on Old Testament leaders were based on 24 books and 11 reputable websites, including National Geographic's Concise History of the World and their Biblical World Atlas, my ancient history textbooks, the Smithsonian and PBS websites, and today's English version of the Good News Bible. These videos in my book are an easy to follow overview of the Bible stories and their times. They are not a scholarly presentation. However, if you are interested in just the basic facts and their context, I hope you will enjoy my work. As I mentioned, the Bible has influenced Western culture in many spheres as noted in this slide. I've been impressed by the song, Turn, Turn, Turn by Pete Seeger and later The Birds. It is unique in that it quotes a biblical passage word for word. The Bible was also used in Abraham Lincoln's House Divided speech and his second inaugural address. And it was alluded to in Martin Luther King's speeches, I've been to the mountaintop and I have a dream. With the story of Abraham, we witnessed the Israelite formation of monotheism in a surrounding polytheistic world. Three monotheistic world religions trace their roots back to Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Abraham's monotheism developed at a time when polytheism reigned throughout much of the known world. The ancient people feared the polytheistic gods and sought to please them, lest horrible things happen, such as floods, drought, pestilence, and other calamities. They tried to please the gods with offerings made to them through their priests, typically burnt sacrifices of their best animals, crops, and occasionally humans. However, Abraham had a direct personal relationship with his God, who was portrayed by some as comparatively a more loving, merciful, and just God. So the Israelites were indeed very different. The story of Abraham is also a story of his faith being tested in unimaginable ways, and a story of a covenant, a solemn promise between God and God's people with mutual obligations. Let's look at where we are in the span of time. Today, we will focus on a very narrow band of human history, around 1800 before the Common Era. By comparison, the Judeo-Christian history spans 4,000 years from 1800 BCE to the present. Yet humans have been around in one form or another for over 3 million years. It's amazing how a 4,000 year Judeo-Christian heritage has had so much influence on people today, people who've been around for more than 3 million years. Our story occurs in the ancient Near East. Using this map, we'll begin in Ur, a prosperous city even in the time of Abraham, 
you'll find it in the lower right-hand corner, northwest of the Persian Gulf on the Euphrates River. Abraham was born in Ur, which was a thriving port city in southern Mesopotamia. Ur was the center of commerce and culture, known for its wealth, learning, and worship of the Sumerian moon god, Nana. The great ziggurat of Ur was dedicated to, to this moon god. When Abraham was young, his father moved the family to Haran, 600 miles upriver to the northwest of Ur. We do not know why they moved, but around this time, the Amalites from Persia were arriving in Ur. Haran was a less prosperous city located at a crossroads used by trade caravans. While Abraham was associated with Ur and Haran, he, like most shepherds, probably lived near the city in tents during the winter and roamed the countryside during parched summers in search of grazing land. Our story begins when Abraham was 75 years old and childless. Children were highly valued in those days, which measured wealth by the size of one's herd. The more children you had, the larger the herd you could maintain. In that time, before money as we now know it, livestock was used as money. Abraham had a vision, probably a dream, of God talking to him. Dreams held a prominent place in ancient culture. They believed that the gods used dreams to predict the future. Nowadays, we think of dreams simply as random thoughts stored in our brains. In this dream, God said, leave your country and go to a land I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. So Abraham started out for Canaan. When Abraham arrived in the town of Shechem, God appeared to him probably in another dream and said, this is the country I'm going to give to you and your descendants. Abraham built an altar to God. In ancient times, altars were built of stone and used to honor a divine event or to give thanks. Typically, sacrifices of animals or crops were made on the altar. Now, Shechem and its surrounding area were not much in comparison to Haran and Ur, just a small, hard scrapple village occupied by another tribe. He's definitely not moving up in the world. In fact, life gets so tough that during a famine, he moves to Egypt's Delta region and gets kicked out after lying to the Pharaoh. I love these Israelite superheroes. They are presented not as perfect models, but very human people with all our usual imperfections. Years later, Abraham had another vision of God promising him a great reward. God had previously promised him many descendants years ago when he was 75. Yet he and his wife, Sarah, were still childless. So Abraham actually talks back to God. What good will your reward do since I have no children to leave it to? Here we have Abraham questioning the value of God's promised reward. <laughs> wow, this is quite a change from the polytheistic practices where only the priests could possibly communicate to God's and certainly not talk back. God told Abraham to look at the sky and try to count the stars. You will have as many descendants as that. So Abraham accepted the promise and placed his trust in God. As the sun set, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and had a most disturbing dream. In it, God said, that Abraham's descendants will be treated poorly as slaves in a foreign land for 400 years. God will punish that nation. God then made a covenant with Abraham, promising to give his descendants the land from the Egyptian border to the Euphrates River in modern day Iraq. Several more years go by without Sarah bearing a child. In accordance with the customs of the time, Sarah told Abraham to try to have a child with her slave Haggard. He agreed and took Haggard as his concubine. She became pregnant and had a son named Ishmael. Abraham had yet another vision or dream of God making a covenant with him. God commanded him to obey. He promised that Abraham will be the ancestor of many nations, that he will have many descendants and that some of them will be kings. Although the Israelites will continue to be tempted by polytheism for many generations, the movement to monotheism was clear with this quote, I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations. 
as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. I will give to you and to your descendants this land in which you are now foreigners. The whole land of Canaan will belong to your descendants forever, and I will be their God. God also commanded Abraham to circumcise every Israelite male, including baby boys. This will be the sign, the physical sign of God's covenant with his people. By the way, circumcision did not start with the Israelites. It had been practiced in ancient Egypt more than 300 years before Abraham and in many other parts of the world. In addition, God mentioned that he, she will give Abraham a son by Sarah. Abraham respectfully bowed down, but could not help but laugh at the thought of a now 100 year old man having a son with a 90 year old woman. So again, he questioned God. Why not let Ishmael be my heir? However, this was never God's plan. God informed Abraham that he will have a son to be named Isaac and that God will keep his covenant through him. Isaac will be the father of 12 princes who will later be known as the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. God also promised to give Ishmael many children. Abraham obeyed God and circumcised Ishmael and all the other males. As promised, Sarah does have a son whom she names Isaac. On the eighth day, Isaac was circumcised. Years later, Sarah told Abraham to send Ishmael and his mother Haggard away. Sarah did not want Ishmael to inherit Abraham's wealth. If Ishmael was not present, he would not inherit Abraham's wealth. Abraham was quite troubled by her request to send his firstborn son away. However, God told Abraham to go ahead as Sarah requested because it was God's plan that Abraham's descendants would be through Isaac, the son God promised. God also mentioned that he would take care of Ishmael. So Abraham did as instructed. He gave Haggard food and a leather bag full of water and sent them away. Islamic custom views God as protecting the lineage of both sons with Ishmael as the ancestor of the Arab people and Isaac as the ancestor of the Jews. Years later, God tested Abraham's faithfulness by instructing him to take Isaac to a mountain in Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. At the top of the mountain, Abraham built an altar with stones, placed wood on the altar, tied up his son and placed him on the altar. As Abraham picked up his knife, an angel called out, Abraham, don't hurt the boy or do anything to him. Now I know you honor and obey God because you have not kept back your only son from him. Again, Abraham was promised as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. Abraham saw a ram stuck in a bush, caught it and offered it as a sacrifice instead. Abraham and Isaac returned home. As you might imagine, many of us have great difficulty with the story of Abraham. First with him abandoning his firstborn son and then preparing to kill his second son as a sacrifice to his God. Let's take a look at the Abraham story. First, it is the beginning of a big shift from the polytheistic religions of the leading nearby Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations, whose gods were selfish mean spirits in need of appeasement, thus they destroy crops and animals, it's the beginning of a shift to a single more loving God who was moralistic. Next, you might ask, was there literary license taken by the author who wrote this account about 800 years after Abraham? Our hero is shown demonstrating his faithfulness by abandoning his firstborn son and then preparing to sacrifice his other son. If the author used literary license to get our attention, the author was certainly successful Faithfulness to the new one God was clearly the message. However, there is also another possible message debated by scholars. Human sacrifice was occasionally practiced in this area, particularly during severe times, such as multi-year droughts, when people were ordered to sacrifice their firstborn sons to please the gods and obtain relief for everyone still left. Perhaps the message the author is trying to convey with this repulsive story is that this one God does not want human sacrifices, that life is more important than the whims of the polytheistic gods. Let's review the significance of Abraham's story. 
He founded the Israelites' monotheism in a polytheistic world. He is a key influencer in three world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. His story is used to emphasize the importance of faithfulness to God with his move to Shechem by circumcising his male family members and his willingness to follow God's request to sacrifice his son. His one God breaks with the polytheistic God's practice of human sacrifice. And God's covenant with Abraham promised to give his descendants the land from the Egyptian border to the Euphrates River, a promise still discussed today in Israel and its occupied territories. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. If you have questions or comments, please contact me at kenwalsh3 at, at icloud.com. For more information, please consider my new book, Bible Stories for All Without the Dogma, a part of cultural literacy. It is a rare book on just the key stories and their context without religious dogma. The stories also include Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, Jacob and Esau, Joseph, Joshua, Deborah, Samson, Ruth, Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, and Esther. You're also welcome to follow me on Facebook at Ken Walsh Author. Thank you for your time today.